Liberty Nation with Tim Donner. Well, we've all read the many screeds in the media about the George Floyd killing and its barbaric aftermath, flash mobs, gangs roaming the streets, people's lives and businesses destroyed. It's been quelled somewhat from the worst of it earlier in the week, but if you, like me, are looking for more than the usual virtue signaling, ain't it awful, it's all white supremacy or all Trump's fault type of analysis of of the real facts on the ground surrounding urban violence in this country in general, in New York in particular, you could do no better than to read a brilliantly composed article entitled Darkness Falls by one of the most respected free market writers of our times, Heather McDonald of the City Journal and Manhattan Institute out of New York, and author of the recent books The War on Cops and The Diversity Delusion, and she joins us now. Welcome to Liberty Nation Radio, Heather. Well, thank you so much for having me on, Tim. I greatly appreciate it. Well, I appreciate having you. have been reading your stuff for many years. Now, your book, The War on Cops, How the New Attack on Law and Order Makes Everyone Less Safe, seems perfectly tuned to the times we're living in. But you wrote that book back in 2016. So how has your assessment of the relationship between cops and communities changed in the wake of the horrors we've witnessed over these last days? Well, I fear that what I wrote about uh, back in 2016 is going to be even worse now. I talked about something I called the Ferguson effect, which is officers backing off of that essential discretionary proactive policing that saves so many lives. We saw that in 2015 and 2016, following the much more limited, in in comparison, uh, riots in Ferguson and Baltimore. Another 2,000 black lives were lost uh, because of officers backing off. Now, and and we also saw assassinations of cops in in 2016, Uh, five in Dallas, several more in Baton Rouge. We're already seeing that in, in a mere one week. I, I fear that cops have a target on their back now. The rage that is being fomented against them based on no data whatsoever about police racism is going to be very hard to come dial back. And the people who are going to be hurt the most, apart from the officers who, as I say, are at risk of their lives, are the law-abiding inner-city residents who desperately beg the police for more protection. So let's talk data instead of narrative. You write uh, in your article that facts don't matter to the academic victimology narrative. Far from destroying the black body, whites are overwhelming targets of interracial violence. And then you bring in the actual numbers. Between 2012 and 15, blacks committed 85 percent of all black-white interracial violent episodes, even though they're just 13 percent of the population. And then it's flipped. Whites committed 14 percent of interracial violent crime, even though they're the majority. So the numbers are completely inverted. Is this something that people are even open to hearing anymore? No, because the media have done such a good job for the last three or four decades at concealing the reality of street crime in the United States. Uh, I'm going to be very blunt here, Tim. Street crime, I'm talking about drive-by shootings, robberies, uh, gun homicides of, of, of strangers as opposed to domestic violence. Violent street crime today has a black and a brown face. Let me give you some data. Uh, in Chicago, blacks and whites are each about a third, a little under a third of the population. Blacks commit 80% of all shootings, whites less than 1%. A black Chicagoan is, is 50 times more likely to commit a drive-by shooting than a white is. In New York City, uh, blacks and Hispanics commit 98% of all shootings. That's according to the victims and witnesses of those shootings, who are overwhelmingly black and Hispanic themselves. So... The pub, you remember the media in the 90s stopped publishing the race of crime suspects because it was so overwhelmingly, uh, they were so overwhelmingly black. And so the public has no idea what goes on in inner city communities and why cops are there uh, disproportionately. It's because they're called there by victims who've just been robbed or have just been shot. I mean, the numbers don't lie, but 
You also write about what you call the ideological handmaiden of this violence, academia. Explain what you mean by that. Well, academia has pumped out for the last three decades the white supremacy conceit, and now we see it has completely taken hold in the culture at large. So universities are committed to racial victimology, to identity politics, uh, many corporations that are run by their HR departments are run by gender studies and race studies graduates. Now, let's talk about New York City, both for, from you as a journalist and a resident of New York City, which was my home growing up. How will New York City be changed after the double whammy of COVID-19 taking a greater toll on New York than any city in the nation? And then this almost unchecked violence in the streets and a mayor who seems to have no clue what to do. Uh, they asked this before, Heather, but I'll ask it again to you. Will New York ever be the same? No, and the real problem is, is not the actual virus toll. It's the fear that's been created. It's the ridiculous uh, social distancing rules, which are completely arbitrary. Uh, the, the economy was already on the ropes thanks to the economic lockdowns. Uh, people were already fleeing the city. Now uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely hopeless. Well, all I can say, Heather, is that I hope you're wrong. I thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Tim. It's great talking to you. Heather McDonald, you can read her stuff at cityjournal.com, and it'll be well worth your while. She's one of the best.